So just settle in and get as comfortable as you possibly can because this is a, a really awesome opportunity to connect with yourself completely and fully. So allow yourself to get into a comfortable position, seated with your spine straight, but relaxed, and just settle in, gently closing your eyes, and then just quiet a bit. Allow yourself now to feel your heart space. Just gently breathe in and out of the heart. Allow your breath to touch the heart. As you go inwardly, feel with each exhale a sense of arriving more and more tangibly. You are home. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, just here now, listening to my voice. As you sit here now quietly, you can feel your heart opening, tangibly touching peace. Just honor yourself now, however you are, acknowledging yourself just as you are. Here and now, welcoming your realization of perfection. Keep breathing deeply and deliberately, relaxing, releasing, and letting go. Take nice, big, deep, deliberate breaths. Relaxing, releasing, replenishing, and letting go. Allowing your breath now to resume its natural rhythm. Noticing the quality of deep, rich, full presence that's right here and right now. Deepen that presence now as we begin to scan the body with awareness, love, and presence. Beginning with your scalp, just soften your scalp. Now softening your brow and softening your eyes. Allow yourself to smile into your eyes. Soft eyes. Smooth brow. Feel a gentle smile on your lips. Relaxing your tongue right down to the root. Relaxing your throat and your neck. Relax your entire mouth now. Blessing the mouth, jaw, and chin. Now bless your entire face and head. Loving your face and head from the inside out. Receptive presence from the inside. Allow your shoulders now to relax back and down a bit. If you discover any tightness or tension anywhere, 
just let it now float in awareness. Feel the tension dissolving now like warm butter melting or ice melting in water. And then water to steam. Feel your arms relax down to your hands, softening the hands from the inside out, softening again and again, still softening from the inside out. Now feel your entire torso. Breathe deeply and deliberately, allowing yourself to fully awaken and bless all of your cells, organs, and systems of your body. Feel your entire body now being embraced by a buoyant and grace-filled light from the inside out. Feel an openness to your chest, a receptivity, a deep relaxation, creating more space to receive gratefully whatever is here and whatever arises. Soften the belly. Soften again. Soften again. Feel a gentle smile in the belly. A sense of joy and spaciousness. A relaxed receptivity. Soften again and again. Feel the hips and the pelvis opening, relaxing and receiving. Responding now to your care, attention and love. Now feel your legs from the inside out and feel immense gratitude for your legs and how they support you and have carried you to many, many places. Acknowledge all of the places you've been where your legs were vital Again, feel your legs with immense gratitude. Again. And again. Feel your feet now from the inside out. And feel the wonder of your feet again from the inside out. Now widen your attention so you can sense your entire field of bodily awareness. Allow yourself to step back and step inward. allowing yourself to let life be just as it is outside of your body now. Yet moving inside your body 
all of your focus and attention is on your presence in this state of grace. Just receiving now from the inside out. Light, all light. Love, all love. Deeply generous, light and love. Receiving now, generous, benevolent, gracious, light and love. All emanating from within. This light and love is generated from within you. All pervasive, all abiding, perfect love generated from within you. This is home, alert and with a relaxed inner stillness, your true reality, open, tender, awake. No matter what, you are enough. You are more than enough. You are home. Resting in that sacred presence now, touching the immortal diamond within, aware fully of the immortal diamond within. And knowing now the face you had before you were born home at last, your truest self welcoming you home. Welcome home. And just allow yourself now to feel the grace and peace and ease of this time with yourself spent in full acknowledgement of yourself and then just let yourself begin to come back into this room gently and easily and completely and then whenever you're ready just let yourself arrive fully and we'll begin Okay, so welcome everybody. It's a great time to be able to be here and to be able to be present the way that we are uh, during this especially interesting time on planet Earth. And then also just to, to kind of compound the, the fact that we are capable of coming into a present moment so tangibly and willingly that enhances our connection with our true self at a time when so many people are, are having uh, many reasons to, to draw our attention outward. And it's kind of like now that we've had a, um, you know, a good three quarters of the year in a situation where it's been upended, unlike anything we've ever known before in life with this pandemic, it's really interesting to watch how life goes on. This too shall pass. And how we're in a state right now where we're becoming cognizant of our own ability to show up to anything to literally anything and to not mind that um, we are in a place where, uh, you know, it seems tumultuous. Okay, so everyone understands that um, for a large part of our life, we're conditioned into 
an experience that tells us that home is found outside of us, that it's something that supports us and supplies us, but it's outside of us. And so when we're young, if somebody asked us, you know, where's our home, we'd give an address, we'd say the people in our house, we'd identify with everything that people taught us is home. And it's that identification with something outside of us is what gives us a sense of safety and security. But I'd like you just to feel for a minute, especially based on after the meditation where we were really acknowledging that home is a, is a state of being deep within us that's cultivated through a connection with our divinity and nothing else can give us this deep sense of safety and security. If that's the truth, and yet since the time you were a little child, you were told to identify home as a place and a situation in life, then you can imagine how much anxiety that has promoted for so many people, because your home can get swept away in a tsunami, or your home can be on fire, or you can, you know, lose your home, you can have people kick you out of home. And especially in circumstances like this, where the world is precarious and tumultuous at, at in a very tangible way, there are a lot of people out there who are concerned for their well-being. And one of the things that they identify as their well-being is having a home. So the, the most important thing I've discovered in, in actually losing a home in my lifetime was when I was in the midst of that situation, only very situated strongly in a miraculous uh, perspective and viewpoint for myself, the, the very first thing that I heard as things were being upended in my life with my physical safety in a home was, Maureen, you are always at home. Fear is the stranger here. Now feel what I just said. This is a lesson in A Course in Miracles that I had read years before the situation, many, many years before the situation I was in. But it came like a big beam of light into my mind. And I wouldn't have remembered that as something that stuck in my mind when I read it. I didn't even remember that that was from A Course in Miracles, but the, there was an ongoing mantra in my inner being that was saying, Maureen, you are always at home. Fear is the stranger here. Now feel what your true home feels like based on a connection to being in a state of grace and feel how fear is the stranger, how it really has no business in a place where you're truly at home. And notice how when a world can be upended, in any way, that it has to be the physical world that we inhabit while we're traversing life on planet Earth. Now, most people, because of that enculturation when we we're young about this is your home and this is your family and this is the thing that you identify with as the safety and security, because most everyone was conditioned into that belief, there are very few people that on planet earth wouldn't identify safety and security with home, an outer home, something that they're living in, a situation and a place. So no wonder so many people find that a fragile existence because first of all, you had to be taught about what makes a home and multiple people now, especially during this pandemic, are deciding to go more tangibly and deliberately inward to their homes or to, to get a bigger, cultivate bigger spaces around themselves or more comfortable spaces if they have the means, while other people are changing homes and situations and going back home if they're adults sometimes to be with family because they don't have the resources. And, and home for everyone on planet Earth right now is having a shift a massive shift and for most people's identification with home. So 
I'm happy for us tonight to come to this place where we're really acknowledging home for the holidays, especially, has to be that we cultivate a much deeper, powerful, and enduring identification with what home is. The first thing that you might want to disassociate from when cultivating this real uh, capacity to identify with the home that goes with you wherever you go, uh, sort of like the shell on a turtle's back, only even more inwardly uh, connected to you. But this home is something that's with you always. And the way to get this true connection is to dissociate with the false self the self that's contingent on identifying with things in the outer world in order to know who it is. You, we all know now that we've identified that false self as the ego, and it's the self that arose in all of us when we felt that there was a need to survive in the world. Before that, if we felt completely safe and secure, many people would, would say if they had a relatively peaceful and calm childhood with loving parents and loving siblings and in a comfortable space and in a home that they felt uh, was, was safety and security for them, then they would feel as though they didn't have impulses to do anything that was promoted by fear. They would feel like they made conscious choices because they didn't feel this idea that I have to survive in the world. I have to make my way and I have to do this without the, the, the cushion of safety and security. That's how the ego arises. But in everyone's world, there are situations that even if you have the most beautiful circumstances growing up, there will be circumstances that make you feel unsafe. And so the reaction to those circumstances, whether it be a mean teacher or you know, losing something that you really love, even if it's an object of some kind, times in your life, you're going to feel as though this false self wants to take over the one who is surviving in the world at large. So you can take a look inward now, since we did that nice deep dive with the meditation and see how much of this false self or the one that arose simply to survive in the world, how much of this false self is occupying time and space in your life? Just ask yourself this question very objectively. No need to dive really deep right now, but just as on a scale from zero to 10, where are you in that zero to 10 frame of reference where my false self or the self that arose for the need to be safe and secure that was feeling upended and to be able to survive in the world uh, in, a, in some way that felt as though it was possible arose from some situations in my life, quite possibly if you feel this, and how much of your life is ruled by that. You might have really by this time, hardly any of your life ruled by that. Wonderful, amazing, and liberation in, in its essence. But you also might have some vestiges that pop up every once in a while where this false self just seems to appear. And you'll know when the self, the, this false self appeared because it feels as though there's, its impulse is to be right, to be um, acknowledged, and to be um, safe and secure. It doesn't ever like taking a back seat. It feels as though it's all about me. And so either it's going to be about you getting a spotlight or about you um, getting acknowledgement or about you being someone who gets the benefit of whatever situation you're in. So it's very outwardly oriented. The true self, however, the real self, uh, the way that I came up with that definition of the immortal diamond was from a Franciscan friar, a wonderful Franciscan friar, Richard Rohr. And he um, actually has a book, The Immortal Diamond. 
And in it, he talks about the immortal diamond as the face you had before you were born. Now feel that and what kind of a home do you put around that face you had before you were born? And this doesn't mean, you know, a fetus face or a baby face. This means that face that's so vast and unknowable by a human mind or a condition or an identification that's solely human. It's the face of God. It's the face of the divine. So this is the face you had before you were born. That's the immortal diamond. That's so treasured and so loved that it never actually ever left the heart of God. So being still in the heart of God, it doesn't identify with a home on this planet. Now feel the difference between someone who doesn't have the, the, the great grace of knowing that there's more and that it's only a, a dream of separation, an impossible dream of separation. So have at it and really have a beautiful home around you. That's not, I'm not saying that isn't something that you can enjoy and benefit from, but know that it's only a reflection at best of the inner world of connection that you feel very tangibly and substantially to your home in the divine. The one that never has to perform never has to even mop or vacuum, <laughs> doesn't have to do anything that the physical world requires to be pristine and beautiful and impeccable. It's the immortal diamond. So the fun part of this is that many people feel one of the qualities of this immortal diamond or this true home within us is peace, unending peace. And if you were to say that to many people on the planet, that the truth of you is unending peace, some people would really be um, put off by that. They would not want unending peace because to them that feels as though it's akin to death, you know, the, you know, peace that doesn't have anything but peace, doesn't feel very exciting, doesn't feel very interesting or enticing. It feels scary, actually, because they think it's normal to be to be someone who has ups and downs and 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 high rises and low pits and and be in a world where there's a this and that. It is that is part of the world. There'll always be an up for a down. There'll always be an in for an out. There'll always be a front for a back. There are always two sides of everything here on planet Earth. But to grapple with the two sides rather than to be able to step above and say, oh, that's a coin. It has a, has a head and a tail, but I can appreciate the coin. I don't need to be all focused on the head or all focused on the tail, or in other words, consumed with the duality of things. When you start to step up and away from this experience of life a little bit, you start to see your place in it with a more humble attitude. You start to realize that the, the more you obsess or the closer in you get to things that you thought you wanted or that you thought were important, the, the less fulfilling they actually become, the more normal they seem, the more you can step back and appreciate everything that's going on in a way that you're acknowledging your true self. And at the same time, you're recognizing that you become part of the flow of life gracefully, then, then you're all set. So the first sign of disconnect is when, especially during the holidays, is when people get impatient or they find themselves scattered or they find themselves to be more consumed in the world and of it. And you start to recognize that there's a, you, you're quick to anger or to be upset. For most people, really not so much for the people here, but for most people, 
that can be very disheartening because you don't know how to get out of that condition. It's the human condition when you're identifying too much with that outer world or the false self. So to get back into this place where we identify more with who we truly, truly, truly are, we need to spend that quality time with ourselves because this self speaks in silence. This self speaks in a way that it goes deeper than any situation at hand. And when you go deeper into the parts of you that are the core, most important and, and real parts of you, something happens. You don't, the deeper you go, you would imagine in the world, like the deeper you go, when you start to tunnel down into something, it feels like it would get more finite. But what happens when you go deep, deep, deeply within is it becomes more expansive. And the more you identify with the reality of you, the more vast you find yourself to be. That's why during the meditation, I often said soft, soft belly, soft belly, because this being our power center is also where if we were feeling ourselves kind of moving down through meditation from our mind to our heart, to our will, you would imagine that you're moving down into a place that can be more um, tight and even resistant. And that can feel like the way you feel on planet earth if you're up against circumstances that you're viewing from the outside and coming in from outside. Let yourself, whenever you feel as though there's a challenge at hand in the outside world, to move inside and let yourself feel your expansive nature. Move deep down into your core, soft, soft, soft belly. This is part of what the Buddhist tradition often would um, talk about, the soft belly, the soft Buddha belly, is a belly that's more like holding everything, holding the whole world and in a, in a lighthearted um, kind of a chuckle this soft belly, feel it. If you really know that you're in charge of a situation, it doesn't tighten you up and it doesn't make you feel resistant and it doesn't make you feel as though you're, you're holding on for dear life. You're soft and relaxed and you're releasing the light of the divine within you. You're deep diving down into the vastness within you, totally comfortable with this experience and you're allowing yourself to feel the vastness within you. You know what happens then is if you actually use your physical body, like we talk often about how in the world of the miraculous, we use the mind to beat the mind. Well, now I'm talking about using your body to beat the body. You're doing a deep dive within you at the same time, really feeling and, and, and envisioning and noticing and touching and tapping the vastness within you, then all of a sudden, even though it's within you, you become released into the vastness. And yet you get there by diving deep. I call this and I've called this and I haven't said this much in, in the Miracle Meeting Place lately, but I've called this whole process channeling, like, that, like the channel between England and France. I thought that was perfect when that came uh, to be because this is the process of how you unearth the home within you. You deep dive with that knowing that you're going to touch a vastness within you. And when you deep dive through your heart and let your heart expand and be opened and free, you're letting your mind be open and free, no labels, nothing, nothing that feels um, important enough to label, to take away your peace of mind, that you can just let it go, let it be. I don't know what it is, but I love it. And then because you're loving it, you're in that space where you're allowing yourself to access your heart. But then when you deeply dive into that core of you and you're noticing and touching vastness, at the same time, you're channeling up and tunneling down. You're channeling. You're channeling up to the vastness of, the, of space and you're allowing yourself to feel the fullness of space, how 
It's your home. There's nowhere that's not your home. And then you're deeply, deeply allowing yourself to move down within your being. And then soon, the more you do this as, as a practice, and I, I can't really say it's a meditation as much as a deliberate intention and visualization that includes the capacity to kind of be still and have that meditation enough to be able to really feel this. As you move down deep within you to this place that's boundless and move into that vastness and it'll, it transcends this limiting physical experience of the body and you move up and touch the vastness of the divine of the heavens and then beyond the heavens to even the vastness that contains the heavens then watch how hard it is to keep any identification in between. This is our home. This is our true home, that we are everywhere and nowhere. The face you had before you were born. And now feel the miracle of this as we're entering into a time where it's important to recognize you're the gift. For the holidays, just this year, especially more than any time ever before this, if you recognize that you're the gift and you're showing up as this spaciousness, as, an, as completely identified with the spaciousness and not this physical form or this finite personality or identity, then what that brings to any situation is a holding space. You're holding space for people. And when they have challenges or identifying with their false self, it doesn't cause you to be reactive because you're not identifying with your false self. Only an ego can react to an ego. Hear that because this is why A Course in Miracles uses the brand of forgiveness that it does. We think that someone's done something to us and that we have to forgive them in a typical forgiveness situation. But in A Course in Miracles, it says what you believe happened never happened. And now you're forgiving it, not to kind of pour pink paint on things or to, to be a good person, but to get to this place where you're, you're using your body to beat your body and you're using your mind to beat your mind. And you're realizing that when you identify with this vastness, the vastness can be the home that's the safety and security where your physical body uh, can, can apparently abide while you occupy a bigger space and a bigger reality. I can't tell you what would happen specifically for you in these situations, but I do absolutely know because this is where your own creative acumen pops in to make every situation unique and to have every problem have an immediate solution that when you're not identified with an ego who's you know relating to an ego and having a challenge with that situation but you're relating to vastness who's holding a space and it just so happens that egos are going to come in and out on planet earth then you don't feel the need to have a running commentary about the unconsciousness in the world. It's just not as enticing or interesting, but you also learn so much that you would never have the capacity to learn by objectively observing and holding space. Primarily what you're going to learn, <clears throat> I'll give you the punchline, is that everybody's doing the best they can. And that when someone's in a place where the ego has taken over, then their identity is so small and they feel like they've lost their home. They have because they're not connected to the true self, to this immortal diamond that they are. And they feel a great loss. It's not so much that they're angry or mad because of a situation that you know is in the world and of it. They're angry and sad because they've lost the connection with something that feels vital and, and more valuable than anything. It's an immortal diamond. Think of that as the treasure that it is. Just hold that in your mind's eye now. 
the immortal diamond. I love that definition of our true reality, that name for our true reality. Because what could be more precious than that? It's your immortality, nothing finite about it, nothing that can be threatened in any way. It's truly the love that you are. And it's multifaceted. It can show up to any situation and any person on planet Earth with whatever facet is most valuable shining brightly. And it's never predictable or ordinary. And this peace that passes understanding that is what's the result of this channeling, channeling deep down and getting to know the deepest parts of us, the recesses of our being, the truth of us, at the same time that we rise up and it's sort of like there's nothing apparent at all, but this vertical identification. And then the, the beauty of this is that it's so seamless and, and precise, like a sharp, sharp sword, as it's moving through your physical awareness, that when it expands outwardly into the vastness of, of the divine above, as above, so below, when you realize that that unboundedness and that vastness of, of being in a state of grace above is the same exact experience below and in the depths of us, it's, it's, um, it's not only infatuating, but it's mesmerizing and captivating so that nothing else in the world really matters. So home for the holidays. Let's just make this a little bit practical because I, I, I wanted to bring you into the state where you understand the value of all that you truly are and the value of your true home that's not in this world or of it. And then step into a world right now where we're kind of thick in the midst of the holiday season, just at the beginning of it, but where people are kind of looking for um, some things to distract them in some cases, or just some love and just some reason to celebrate or feel joy. I notice a lot of people are putting out their holiday lights a lot earlier than they may have before, just because they want to bring more light and levity to their situations in their homes. But feel this now that if you know that we have an unmovable, unshakable place within us that identifies solely with the divine, with vastness, with perfection, with the eternal diamond, that there's nothing that here on earth could make you any happier or any more perfect or any more whole. Yet, when you play around in planet Earth, because you happen to have a body still, and you're here for this beautiful finite time and experience to share and enjoy and to hold space and to be love and to be loved, receive love, the more you receive love, you'll recognize it's not because you need it, you need it, you need it, because it's a lifeline, you know, I mean, the love of other people. It's because you're recognizing that when you receive love from other people, you're allowing them to love, which gets them to know themselves even more deliberately and intentionally. They might not know that because people think you get love. Uh, I, I, they, they identify with I'm in love with that you're getting love from someone else so that the moment the person doesn't look like they're, you know, they're distracted or doing something else. It could be a, a child with a parent or a teacher where the teacher is busy and all of a sudden they feel like they're left out or they're dropped because they're not getting the love or attention right then and there or from a, from a significant other. But that's our human form of love, that we don't recognize that the way you feel love is when you give it. So once you recognize that, that you have this infinite capacity to love, this never-ending well and vastness within you that's just all love, and the more you want to experience that, the more you tap it and give it and show up in it, and, and personify that, 
the more you're letting other people feel just comfortable and, and not, not judged and in a place where they then can feel free to love or to show up themselves. And then as they give who they truly are, they know themselves and they start to feel more at home. And you'll feel this, that not only during that situation where I was losing my home on planet earth, did I, and I heard Maureen, you are always at home. Fear is the stranger here. Well, I went out into the world more at home and then other people felt at home around me. It was really interesting because during that time I was thinking, you know, I don't know how people are perceiving me, but everybody's still asking me for help. And here I am, like with not, I remember a person that I had known from um, eighth grade found me on Facebook and um, I had just literally lost everything and just wound up connecting with her when she found me. And it was nice to, you know, I had, remember used to go over to her house for lunch when I was in third and fourth and fifth grade. And Shortly into this newly revived uh, friendship, she was moving to a new place from the place that, you know, she had grown up and she stayed in the same town we grew up for a long time and was moving. And she had older kids that, you know, were graduating college and things. And she started freaking out about moving, that it was so scary and she couldn't do this and, and having all kinds of problems around that she was perceiving around her life. And, and I was kind of like, you know, just holding the space and, and being there. But the inside of me was thinking, this is really interesting because, you know, she has a husband who has a job is being relocated. They're going to a home that's that they really want to. They're actually in a place that they're going to be able to have a lot more money because of what they sold. All these conditions that are fairly easy and something to celebrate were really challenging and 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 everything about it was feeling chaotic to her. And I was thinking, wow. I didn't even know where I was going when I was leaving my home. And all I kept hearing was, Maureen, you're always at home. Fear is a stranger here. So I kind of like just showed up wherever I showed up and figured that I'd know when I, I landed because I would be told to stay. And I have to say that because it was interesting for me to observe uh, 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 normal reactions to things like moving. And I remembered my past before I had any clue of who I was, the reality of home. I remember moving like six times in a period of two years and feeling really upended and feeling like where's home and needing to find an anchor and, and in order to feel comfortable or safe. Well, you know, that's not the case for us when we begin to identify with this immortal diamond and recognizing that our home and our true identity is this face we had before we were born. I mean, what kind of home does that being abide in other than in a state of grace? So, so let's just settle in for a moment now and just feel this grace of recognizing that you're always at home, no matter where you are. And that in that, you can start to identify with what kinds of situations first beginning to acknowledge and to really feel yourself sink into this experience of being at home in the vastness, you know, no edges, really amazing. Like if I can't even grab an edge, how, where's the four walls? Where's the roof over my head? I'm at home in the vastness. Once you're at home in the vastness, what that begets is a capacity to be able to put the walls around you and to be able to find the places that resonate with you most. Because you show up, that's literally all you're doing is you show up in life. And you'll see that certain things you draw to yourself based on 
that this becomes a fun experience of life now because it's not finite. There's nothing to covet or to need that things come and go and come and go and come and go again. That'll happen in all of our lives to every single one of us. And when they come and go, they're in this space that you identify with the vastness of being at home. You appreciate what's on the radar at the moment and that's in your life at the moment. But at the same time, it isn't wrenching to let it go. That you recognize that if it brings you peace in this moment to appreciate it and to love it and to really value it while you have it, but then to know that if you let something go, this too shall pass and then there's this. In this world of the divine where we know and tap the vastness, we always have access to the and then there's this. There's never a finiteness to the story. There is no finiteness to this true home. It's vastness. It's, it's the part of us that cannot be lost. So now get that. If you're in a world where things are coming and going, and I mean there can be times where loved ones and, and beautiful beings, you know, are, are pets and, and people who have crossed our lives that mean so much to us. I'm not belittling the feelings that we have when we love these beings and these places and these homes that we have if there is a, a loss in our lives. But just do know that the divine never sees us with anything but impeccable love. So the divine knows what we don't know about ourselves when we're in an ego orientation or our false self orientation. And loss makes us makes many people identify with the false self right away so that you never even get a chance to sit with what could appear to be a loss until the divine embraces it the divinity of you, the vastness of you, deep, deep and high, high and wide, the one that annihilates the finiteness of us until that vast, big, spacious being gets a chance to embrace the situation and, and then acknowledge how much you're loved for you, with you, to you, through you so that you're knowing and feeling the love that you are and, and, and are always embraced by, then watch how it expands you in your capacity to receive more. We often believe that loss causes us to sacrifice and suffer. So then the next, the and then there's this that's at hand, often we don't embrace it right away or, or I'll allow ourselves to view it or see it right away. That is because we're in a world of time and space where I have to say, and this is very hard for some people to believe, but it's the truth that when you have a loss, it's much more valuable to resonate with the fact that it just left more space for more, for more. Now, in my experience of having, in quotes, lost loved ones like my parents, what it allowed for me to do and other beautiful, valuable loved ones in my life, what my divine identification with home being vastness has allowed for me to do is be able to touch base with them on the other side. We all have this capacity. There's nobody special here. And there are, you, you've heard of bound people who are psychics and intuits and who touch base with people on the other side all the time. They haven't gone anywhere. If they're on another frequency like changing the station on a radio and if we really think of them with this unbounded love not the finite love that can that feels the loss of love but the unbounded part of us that knows they're still here but in our finite limitation of a mind that identifies with a body we might not be able to touch base with them if we're finitely oriented 
all the more reason to be able to take this capacity we all have to touch vastness, to know vastness, to identify with vastness as our home, and to really take that seriously in a way that if someone you love has gone before you, then they must be paving the way for you to transcend limiting beliefs to the degree that you can also tap the vastness even while in a physical body. That requires a couple of things. One is that um, you can touch in meditation or even in waking life, but by being very present moment oriented so that you're here and now and in a state of appreciation and self-love, that's those are the keys to the doorway. When you're in a state of appreciation and self-love, in other words, identifying with this immortal diamond of you that has all these vast facets that can touch and tap all aspects of the divine. When you begin to identify with that being, and that's a sinking in and a rising up, and in that moment of, of you know, that razor's edge of moving high and deep, you're annihilating the identification with this finiteness and limitation of the physical body. When you're there in this experience, then you start to know there's more. There's more than this. You know there's more than this. You're not looking for there must be more than this, which I have to say is typically the mantra of the human dilemma. There must be more than this. No matter what someone achieves, no matter what somebody experiences, they wonder a little part of them, even if they're in the middle of getting a Nobel Peace Prize or Academy Award, even if they've got the home of their dreams, even if they've gotten acknowledgement and the massive pay raise that they were working towards. There's a part that gets happy and satisfied in that one moment that you're present and feel the elation of an achievement. But just on the heels of that, there's a, a little thought that hits everyone's mind. There must be more than this. The reason being is that there is. The truth of us knows there is. And, and that's why we are so hell bent, you know, through, through many uh, devices like, like religions in making meaning here. We're hell bent on making meaning of things on planet earth because it somehow never makes the mark that we always know there must be more than this. So we look for the meaning that this meaning, this will give it meaning. This will make me have the meaning to be able to, to make this worthwhile. And, and then we look to beings who've come here and embodied this vastness so substantially and so capably like, like uh, ascended masters and Jesus and Buddha and multiple saints that have come here to that have allowed themselves to transcend their limiting beliefs to the fact that they could, you know, um, literally levitate or, or do things that have appeared to be superhuman. We're all meant to touch and taste this in to the degree that we resonate with it. If we don't resonate with transcending our limitations or overcoming <clears throat> every single kind of pain there could possibly be, then you're gonna be uh, more infatuated with the world and being in the world and of it. That's just the way of it. But the more you become aware that there has to be something more than this, and then you allow yourself to sit with that. And as I was be starting to say before, but now I'm, I'm finishing that thought, you have to be able to sit in stillness, a stillness that feels as though you're abiding in peace, as though you're home, you're completely accepted. There's no need to perform, not even meditate perfectly, not even get still perfectly. Just let yourself let go of all of the 
things that have kept you separate from the big exhale, the big relax. And when you just relax into the arms of the divine and allow yourself to hold that image in your mind, the face you had before you were born, this was the one that was at home and remains at home and that you are still. And if you can feel and touch that face you were before you were born and really truly feel and it, and it will well up from your heart in my experience, the immortal diamond, when you can sit in that space where you acknowledge the reality of the immortal diamond and how no body could annihilate that, no body's action, no body's assault, nothing at all to do with the false self could ever annihilate that, whether it's you and doing unkind things to yourself and having thoughts that demean you or don't respect you or love you enough, which really almost every human thought we have is not enough because the love that we are is so much more vast and amazing and beautiful than what anything a human mind can come up with. So letting yourself just relax is the main thing. The one who relaxes the most wins. And just letting yourself now feel, what does that feel like if I came to this whole holiday season feeling already at home in that deep, deep well of vastness within me and that high, high light elation of channeling and connecting the, the utmost and the inmost and letting myself just forget everything having to do with the surface experience of life while I dive deep into every relationship and encounter I have, while I allow myself to be fully present, even though we're masked, even though we have these identities that are still becoming more entrenched in, in the identification of the human body, but respecting that, that everybody's in this human condition together. And since we have a body, we're in this human condition with everyone else. So the best news is that when you start identifying with your true home, you get it that you came here to be a light in the darkness when people are identifying with this finiteness and wondering, is there more? There has to be more. Not only just about more to life on planet Earth, but most people are still not entirely convinced that there's more after death. That, that, that this idea of death is so real to so many that they have a hard time not being consumed by that thought or obsessed with the finiteness of it and having it somehow overrule every situation so that it can't, if you begin to transcend this experience of finiteness, all of a sudden the ego really balks at that. Only an ego can be in conflict with other egos. And so only an ego can be afraid of, of the experience that other humans are having of death. That's, that's an ego experience. So letting yourself now just sit back, take a big deep breath of grace, the same breath that you came in with, you're still breathing now today, and you'll continue that experience and that connection while on planet earth as a reminder of your vastness, of your unquantifiable nature, as this breath moves through you and continues on through your life, you'll see that um, to allow for it to move into the vast expanse is the way that we're released into the light of who we truly are. I'm just gonna read a little short passage here of A Course in Miracles and, and let you hear this little bit about at home in God. This is chapter 10 in A Course in Miracles. You do not know your creations simply because you would decide against them as long as your mind is split and to attack what you have created is impossible. So 
what it's saying here is that we're, we're truly like God in this, at home in God. We're truly like God in this, in that every single thing that we see on planet Earth with our two eyes or feel or sense with our six, with our five senses, are is is our creation. So the divine of us, God, has created us. So we're the creations of the divine. The one difference between us and God, there's only one difference, and we can really change this. We can annihilate this difference, is that God loves us impeccably. There's never a moment that God's creations, us, are not perfect, because that's the only image, the only space, the only home that God holds for us as the creator, the great creator with the capital C. The difference is, is that we have the same capacity, we were given the same exact capacity as God to create a world, to create beings. And so every single thing that we see with our two eyes and sense with our five senses on this planet is our creation. But we have this love-hate relationship with everything on planet Earth. So we choose we think this gives us free will to choose. I'll love that. I'll hate that. I'll, mm, this is passable. This is acceptable. Or I can, you know, I can live without that. That's never what the divine does with us. It cherishes us, adores us, appreciates us impeccably. We are the immortal diamond. We're, we're all treasure and no problem. And yet when we look at life on earth and the this and that of things, we forget that we had the same capacity that the divine has to look upon our world as created perfectly. And that means all of it. That means again, like when we come up against the hard stuff, we have to say, what's the purpose here? Like, where's the expansiveness in this? Where's the miracle here? Where's the delight in this? And if it seems like there's no delight whatsoever, sit still and hang in there and watch. And you'll see, like, it was pretty fun for me. I didn't feel any reason to judge the friend that I had from grammar school who was having a freak out time with her move. I just got an example of what it feels like to be a typical humanly oriented person having their home upended and, and creating a new life. And realizing that, wow, I didn't feel any of that. And, and, and how funny that she thinks that she knows me now that we reconnected and has no idea that what I was experiencing in human terms was a thousand times crazier and more upended than exactly what she was describing. And didn't make me feel anything other than, oh, by viewing her experience, I get a chance to notice that I've actually transcended some of the, some of the ideas on planet earth that appear to be super difficult. And it's not either here nor there. I was just happy that I didn't have to feel those kinds of feelings that she was in the midst of very genuinely feeling because they just didn't go, I could go deeper and higher and all of that vastness annihilated the finite world of challenge and pain. So uh, here we are. You do not know your creation simply because you would decide against them as long as your mind is split and to attack what you have created is impossible. But remember that it is as impossible for God the law of creation is that you love your creations as yourself because they are part of you. Everything that was created is therefore perfectly safe because the laws of God protected it by his love. Protected by his love. Any part of your mind that does not know this has banished itself from knowledge because it has not met its conditions. Who would have done this but you? Interesting, isn't it? And hard to admit that we're the source of all our own problems. 
Recognize this gladly, for in this recognition lies the realization that your banishment is not of God and therefore does not exist. You are at home in God, dreaming of exile, but perfectly capable of awakening to reality. Is it your decision to do so? You recognize from your own experience that what you see in dreams you think is real while you are asleep. Yet the instant you awaken, you realize that everything that seemed to happen in the dream did not happen at all. You do not think this strange, even though all the laws of what you awakened to were violated while you slept. Is it not possible that you merely shifted from one dream to another without really waking? Would you bother to reconcile what happened in conflicting dreams, or would you dismiss both together if you discovered that reality is in accord with neither? Would you bother to reconcile what happened in conflicting dreams, or would you dismiss both together if you discovered that reality is in accord with neither? You do not remember being awake. When you hear the Holy Spirit, you may feel better because loving then seems possible to you, but you do not remember yet that it was once so. And it is in this remembering that you will know it can be so again. What is possible has not yet been accomplished, yet what has once been is so now, if it is eternal, the eternal diamond. When you remember, you will know that what you remember is eternal and therefore is now. You will remember everything the instant you desire it wholly. This is a key right here. This is one of those, you know, I always give those gold star places in A Course in Miracles. This is really key. You will remember everything the instant you desire it wholly. For if to desire wholly is to create, you have willed away the separation, returning your mind simultaneously to your creator and your creations. I want to read that again because it's so important. And I'm just going to say something about that that'll give you a real nudge and a key on how to be at home always. You will remember everything the instant you desire it wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly. For if to desire wholly is to create, you will have willed away the separation, returning your mind simultaneously to your creator and your creations. Knowing them, you will have no wish to sleep, but only the desire to waken and be glad. Dreams will be impossible because you want only truth and being at last your will, it will be yours. Now, this is the key to awakening. Treating your creations the same way that God treats us, no matter what we do, we're perfect. No matter what dream we're dreaming, it's a dream that we can awaken from. And often times we will dream things that are horrifying to wake us up and when we don't love what we're dreaming then we're separate from our own recognition that we're dreaming so in essence when it says here you will remember everything the instant you desire it holy for if to desire holy is to create you will have willed away the separation you get it if there's a little part of us, this little tiny part of us that holds back from loving things completely, no matter what, like, I don't know what it is, but I love it. Really, literally, that's a key to liberation. If you don't know what it is, but you love it, it means you're at home enough in yourself to accept anything, that nothing is going to take you away from yourself which is in alignment with the divine, which knows and loves you impeccably. So you're admitting that and accepting that now. And because the divine knows you and loves you impeccably, why would anything else capture your imagination if only an ego can recognize an ego? So when anything else is happening outside that feels off, if you feel the need to be able to do anything to it fix it or change it or in order to love it and i'm not saying help help is different if you feel 
compelled because you can feel that someone is asking for you to be the light in the darkness or the awake one in the dream. It's a lot different. Uh, just this past week, someone came to me who's been having a really hard time during this pandemic and lost uh, a pet during the pandemic. And everyone knows how challenging that is. And I mean, he was really good with this pet taking this dog and, and getting an operation, used all his um, the money that he got from the stimulus to, to give the dog an operation and then the dog passed. And he was like his buddy buddy. And, um, and he's having trouble with drinking and trying to anesthetize the pain of all of that. And he has never before this been to anyone for counseling or for any help and was kind of like new and, and discombobulated in the experience and, and also, you know, not comfortable at all with being um, that vulnerable and also trusting of who, you know, who am I not knowing me well enough. And I said, I just want to say something to you. Don't think you have to fix yourself before you come. It's all good. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is that you're feeling or doing or experiencing, it's all good. It's fine. Can you see the difference between that and trying to fix somebody or in quotes, help somebody from a challenging situation where they're feeling that they are not good enough to begin with? That, that they must have been dropped because how could it be so hellish in my world if I wasn't dropped or maybe not significant enough or certainly not loved enough? When, when you are identifying with the immortal diamond in yourself, that that's all you can see in someone else. And that's all you can identify with in someone else. And then you can see them out the other side in that space where they're holding their own treasured self in their awareness. And they're able to transcend the limiting experiences that are so painful here for all human beings. When you also let people know that this is part of the human condition, that this is not unique to you, you're not failing at anything. You're not a mess because you're, you know, a lost cause. This is the human condition. We feel separate from the delight and the love and the peace and the joy of who we truly are because we're living a nightmare of a dream of separation instead of the reality of what's really going on. So here you will remember everything the instant you desire it wholly. For if to desire wholly is to create, you will have willed away the separation. See, no need for separation to navigate this world. No need at all for separation to navigate this world, except that I hold the identity of a human body enough to be able to relate to a human body who's just had a great loss of another body. And at the same time, though, not getting sucked into that story of what a sucky world we have, that this kind of pain exists and this kind of challenge and tragedy has to happen. No, no, no. You're holding this space where you see the vastness and the perfection at the same time until you're able to really uh, infuse that into their experience and you'll know you're doing it because all of a sudden they don't know why they feel better. They don't know why they're, they're feeling peaceful or more at ease. They're feeling more spaciousness within. It's the same thing that the divine wants us to feel because it's the reality. The vastness is the reality. God is the reality. Whatever you see God as the nameless one, the one that you were before you had a face and you were born. This part of us that's at one with the divine that has no name, no face, and is only identified with the vastness and the perfection of that is the one who knows that no matter what arises here, if we see it through the eyes of love and we see it through the eyes of perfection, that, that that's what will appear. 
I know you're all here right now in this place that there can't be anything else more satisfying or soul satisfying or fulfilling for you than to be able to hold this kind of space for, for your creations, for anyone else or anything else you see in the world. But don't forget that the instant you desire it wholly is the day that you awaken. And that means that you can't hold any grudges and you can't feel homeless just because your outside world is being upended. That you have to admit that you're so much more than this, no matter what it is. So this holiday season, you know, we use holidays as a way to mark things and to make meaning. In a typical life where we're not having a pandemic and we're not having, you know, tragedies paving the way throughout our days and in a personal life or level, then we sometimes, you know, become complacent and we sometimes feel, you know, life could be boring or it's too cushy or too good or too easy or blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, we've evolved in all kinds of ways so that technology is making life a little bit easier. And that's the goal for a lot of people is to make it easier here. But then when it becomes easier, they don't understand why do the, does it not feel fulfilling? And it's because we're in this world where we'll always be challenged with seeing our creations as perfect. And we'll always find, and then, and then there's this and something else to resonate with and something else to need or to have or to do or to be. So letting yourself again notice the one who relaxes the most wins means that's the one who's touching the vastness and being aware of this immortal diamond when you show up for the holidays and you want to be at home for the holidays, recognize that you don't need an occasion to be your brilliance, to be the light that you are. But at the same time, while other people are looking for some, some levity or lightheartedness or a reason to celebrate or a reason to feel joy, then show up in that fully embracing the, you know, humans in the human condition, just as they are, how they are, and, and know that these are your creations and they're perfect. No matter what they think about themselves, no matter what they're going through, no matter what the changes are happening in the world, it's all perfect at the level of the, the divine when we are identified with the immortal diamond. Okay. I'm wondering if you guys have any questions at all. And just to recognize that, you know, this impossible dream. And this is the first place, you know, I've I heard that impossible dream um, inwardly in meditation. But this is the first time, place where I recognize that it's actually said in A Course in Miracles, dreams will be impossible because you will want only truth and being at last your will, it will be yours. You know, the impossible dream just came to me in, in like dialogue and meditation that this is just not possible, that you can be separate to the degree that people believe they are while living on human and lives, living human lives on planet Earth. Um, when you recognize that it's an impossible dream and you know you want only the truth behind it all, then it will be yours. So also know this be patient with yourself because there must be things that that are captivating or infatuating or enjoyable or amazing or that you feel still there's a lot less um, enticement to be completely at peace than it is to experience some of these things on planet earth because otherwise we'd be have in a place of freedom and transcendence because we wouldn't feel uh, sucked in to a lot of the challenges here or the problems here. Just know this, they'll still exist while you have a human body and you're relating to other humans. But the best way I have found to maintain a life that's fun and joyful and purposeful on planet Earth is to love my creations and love what everybody's doing and how they're doing it and how they're choosing to experience life on their terms. And they can be aware and awake and conscious or not aware and awake and conscious. And it's all good because uh, this is not our home. Our true home 
is impeccable and un infallible and undefeatable and we don't have to worry about ever losing our place in our true home okay so i have a few questions if you guys don't or any comments does anybody else have anything to say about any of this you know about how to move into the holidays in a way that you're feeling more aligned with the truth of you and this immortal diamond than than anything at hand on planet earth right now okay um here's a question number one here i feel so distracted and unsettled during the holidays maybe it's the added pressure any tips on how to actually enjoy them okay one thing that i would highly recommend during the holidays if you feel so distracted and you said uh, maybe it's the added pressure of of you know performing would be the only reason that you'd feel added pressure or needing to be something that you believe you're not. Just remember that whenever there's an identification with I'm not, then that means you're identifying with the ego. And that's always going to make things harder, more pressure filled and unsettled. And that's its whole purpose is to upend the peace and the joy and the love inherent in your truest identity and in your life. And so no, notice that, that it comes and enters your life to usurp the moment, not to have you fully engage with the moment. The ego has an agenda. It's the voice of separation. So no matter what delight is at hand, it's going to try to separate you from it. In, in order to keep you busy and occupied with the things of this world, because this is the ego's home. And it believes that this is the most important thing and the most important place to be. Yet the reality of you, your free true spirit, knows the vastness of you and knows the unbounded and the infinite of you, identifies only with this immortal diamond within you. And that immortal diamond just shines. It's multifaceted. It's captivating when it shows up. You're captivated by it yourself because it's sometimes unusual if you've been ego driven for quite a while. And I'm not meaning when I say ego driven, I'm not meaning just selfish or oriented towards, you know, the I mean my. But often ego driven can also mean I'm not enough. The ego wants you to believe you're not enough. Yet if you arrive in any situation and understand this true dynamic that you have available to you that if you were acting like the god or goddess that you are then you'd recognize that everything on planet earth is your creation the way you're perceiving it the way you're experiencing it is your literal creation it's all being filtered through your perception and you would choose just to love it no matter what it is love it and then watch how that creates a situation that morphs whatever's at hand that's a limiting belief or a limiting false identity in other people and in yourself. The only thing you have to know about this is it might not happen in a split second if, say, you have relatives and you're, you're visiting people for the holidays and you're used to being distracted or unsettled during the holidays. And like you said, then there's this added pressure to maybe perform for others. If other people are used to you performing in a relationship with them and their life is based largely on what's happened in the past to be able to live the present based on the past and to, to move into the future in a safe way that's quantifiable and they see you show up and all of a sudden you decide to be the embodiment of peace and joy and love and, and, and happiness and I don't know what it is, but I love it and just love everything, they might be a little stuck in their ways and that's where you have to let go of attachment to results and just be the light that you are because that's who you truly are. And, and you don't need to be what you're not for anybody. You just be unapologetically amazing and beautiful and brilliant because that's what the soul of you or the truth of you is. 
the part of you that hasn't been touched by imperfection in any way. It's, it's the immortal self. So we all have it. The only thing is, is the more you embrace it and know it and love it and, and abide in this space, the more happy and easy and, and delightful and expansive your life will be. Holidays, no holidays. You're going to feel yourself being at one with something that feels so much more fulfilling and so much more than anything that you can imagine experiencing on planet Earth without this connection. It's all about connection. Connect. It's like plugging in a light and the light can go on as long as you connect the plug into the wall, into the socket. That's what this is. Before you do anything during the holidays, the tips I would give are allow yourself to connect first and foremost. And then no matter what you're experiencing outside, just notice it if it's unsettling and let yourself reconnect because whenever you're unsettled, it means you're just disconnected. You just forgot that you're the light. Un you unplug the light, now plug it back in. And it's really just as simple as that. Just notice that your outside world is only a reflection of whether or not you're plugged in and let yourself reconnect. So the main tip is to stay connected rather than disconnected and to enjoy yourself completely and allow for yourself to know that as you are in a state of being that's connected and, and joyful and happy and loving, then everyone else, it's like being plugged into the light, everyone else gets the benefit of that and no attachment to results. Other people might be feeling you know, all kinds of things. And that's not your business. Just be unapologetically brilliant. Okay. The next one. I hate to admit this, but I largely loathe myself. I'm never good enough. How can I begin to like myself more? Well, the, the challenge here is that your identification is with a self that you're not. And that might sound a little bit confusing, but stay with me for a minute here. If you largely loathe yourself, then that would be the disconnected self, the one that's not the truth of who you are, that you're identifying with, because only that one feels separate enough to be able to have an experience like loathing, self-loathing or loathing anything else or any, anyone else. Just take a moment now. I love that you're so candid and you say this, that, you're, that you largely loathe yourself. Um, you're never good enough. You're always enough. That's the main thing here. We're always enough. We're enough. We're enough to move mountains. We're enough. But it's the true self of us that has all of these qualities and capacities. When we're identified with a self that's separate from that, we feel lost and confused and we feel like we're dropped. The one thing that we forget is that we dropped ourselves. It's an impossible dream. We cannot be dropped. So what you want to do is begin to spend more quality time with yourself. At first, it might be hard to spend some time in silence because that, that part of us that when we get quiet, you'll hear that voice sometimes even louder that's telling you, oh, you're not even good enough to sit still and meditate. Just let yourself say, yeah, whatever, to, to this voice that's chattering incessantly. And do this in this way, that it becomes more interesting, that you begin to watch that there's not what some people call a committee. There's not even just one voice. There are a whole lot of voices that are vying for your attention. And they're the voices that relate to things in the world. You know, they're going to wake you up the first thing in the morning to wonder what the headlines are. They're going to say, you know, what's the, I, how am I going to make it through this day? What kind of disaster uh, do I have to avoid? Or what's the, when's the next shoe going to drop? This is the voice of the separate self. It's the false self. It, it arose in order to be able to get you to feel that you could survive in the world. And it, it has this kind of very compelling um, feel to it. Like, listen to me, I'll keep you safe. And yet it's, it's very offensive. It's never highlights your best assets or traits. It never 
acknowledges the the goodness and the truth and the beauty of you which are all innate qualities of the divinity of you which you truly are the real self and it it kind of keeps this fast moving fast paced hard to keep up with continually abusive dialogue going that even if it's trying to captivate you to be preoccupied with other things you know in the name of interest it still never leaves you enough time or space to know who you truly are. So in the beginning, especially, you have to take back the reins a little bit and to really deliberately say and mean that you want to feel self-love, that you want to feel the love that you are. And that means sitting with yourself. And I highly at this point recommend that you journal, get all of it out, brain drain it, spit it all out on the page and get everything out that that voice or that committee of voices are, are saying to you and that occupy your time and space. Just get it all out. It's like a purge. And once you, it's heard, once it's acknowledged, and especially when you have it on a page, you don't have to believe what's said. I highly recommend not to believe what it says because it's all insanity. It's talking about, you know, conjecture and, and commentary on things that are just in the world and of it that, are, that might seem vitally important, but just this too shall pass. They come and they go and they come and they go and they come and they go again. When you start to notice this, it actually feels like you're being loving and kind to yourself that you even spend that much time to spill it all out on the page. And I highly recommend at least two full pages, if not three full blank pages to fill them up, just to purge it all out. And once you have, you're going to start unearthing the real voice of you because it's kind of laid there nice and silent and dormant, but it never goes away. It's the truth of you. But it, it knows that it doesn't need to be highlighted or be in this place of obsessive chatter. It's the still small voice within but it's your true nature and it's who you truly are. You want to connect with this part of you. If you largely loathe yourself, as you say in this question, and you feel you're never good enough, there's only one way to like yourself more, to begin to get to know the real you. That's not the real you. That's a pseudo character that your ego made up and it'll never be good enough. So don't bother going there. You want to transcend that world of limitation that that ego keeps you occupied in. And you can only do that by going in. I promise you, I, I call this experience channeling because you tunnel down deep beyond and behind all of the garbage and the muck and the mire. And you go down deep till you find this pristine pool, this gleaming pool and a vastness and light within you and then you rise up you take everything that's all this muck and mire throw it on the table and you let the divine beam light down on it i don't know what it is but i love it just let yourself sit in the space of spaciousness and vastness at first it might be a little challenging to do that because you'll hear a lot of incessant chatter but begin to observe it just watch it just watch it with interest. Don't push it away. Don't shove it away. Watch it with interest. And you'll start to see that there's an observing self, the one who can watch it with interest and without judgment and even let it come and go and even get riotous and even more abusive. But it watches it and says, this too shall pass. You're just fine. Not only are you just fine, you're perfect. And because it's not an, an, a mad voice, it's a voice of reason. It's a voice of your own best interest. When you start to connect with it, you'll know because it's the kind of voice that'll bring tears to your eyes. It'll because it loves you so much. This is the truth of you, not just a voice. It's your true being. It's the most substantive part of you. It's all of you. And it's here to hold you in a state of grace that you could never be dropped and never be left alone in an uncaring, unkind world or situation or unkind, uncaring body and mind that you've been experiencing with yourself. 
and just know it's there. Hang around, expect miracles and, and keep, keep up this self-inquiry that looks at yourself objectively, but do not believe anything that says you're not lovable and that you're not perfect. This lovable perfection within you, this, this immortal being that's pure perfection and, and absolutely impeccable and has never been dropped is there time to do a deep dive and begin to start to excavate. Just enter in with curiosity. There are always divine beings around us helping us and assisting us in this when we have a pure intention to just even just utter a prayer like help, help me. But no, you're not asking your ego for help or that voice of separation for help. You're asking the divinity within you, the one that's the be all end all and, and the allness of it for help. And now you're on the right track. Good luck with this. And, you know, we're here um, in a miraculous space holding you in the light. So you're not alone, no matter what. And then just one more here. Um, how do I deal with holiday blues, which seem especially pronounced during this pandemic? So many losses. I acknowledge that many people are experiencing lots of loss and lots of pain and lots of challenge on planet earth. And it's all the more reason to begin to cultivate a capacity to know that this is the finite part of things. And the, the challenges that we're experiencing all have to do with being in the world and of it, having an identity that's with a human body in a human life, in a human world, the human condition. Just once in a while, give yourself a break, even if this is hard to believe, even if this is new to you that you don't entirely resonate with, or you maybe have never resonated with being a divine being. But you were before you were born, and you will be after you leave this planet. There's no annihilating the truth of you. It's immortal and impeccably perfect. And if you could just for a moment step outside of yourself and outside of this finite world and these limitations and challenges that you have and that you're feeling and let yourself move into a place where maybe it isn't so much a loss, but it's a shift and a change. And what we do to ride out shifts and changes the most easily and effortlessly is we shift our perception to move along with the changes and the shifts that are happening. So right now, it might appear like we're having a lot of losses, but what if for the person who, or the beings who have left, for them, it's just like opening a door and going into another room. They're in another experience. And this is a never ending experience. Our, our huge, vast capacity and eternal nature just shifts from place to place and situation to situation. And sometimes when a situation becomes untenable or unbearable, it's a lot more fun and interesting and enticing to just move into another situation. Now we on planet earth don't necessarily like that idea that people leave and that there it feels like we have a lot of losses of all kinds that not just people but situations change and we want things to kind of stay the same to be safe to be happy well we all know at the same time that that's an impossibility that things will change and shift and expand and when we begin to not only just accept that or tolerate that, but love that, that that actually means that there'll always be, and then, then there's this to the story, that things will change, this too shall pass, then, then the only thing missing in that equation is the fact that your vision has to become 
more expansive and capable of seeing that the and then there's this is always expanding into a and then there's this is a is even better than this so i know a lot of people can find that hard to resonate with that idea because they feel in a in a world where you're oriented towards loss as your perception rather than gain in changes you're going to have to to really take this in a personal way and bring it home and let yourself sit with things it's easiest when you're feeling a little bit more um, peaceful. So when you have an immediate loss, sometimes it's very hard to see the, the grace in the situation. Let yourself just go to a place that feels more peaceful, maybe sit under a tree if the weather's fine, or, or go to a place where you feel more peace and spaciousness. Embrace yourself where you are. Let yourself first get into a, a place where you're being kind to yourself or looking for ways that you can resonate with something that already is inherently peaceful, uh, a happier person that you're friends with, um, you know, being in situations where there feels like there's a, a little bit of a levity and delight at hand. When you're in that place where you're feeling a, a little bit of a sense of relief and really look for these places, even on planet earth, you know, the finding yourself, you know, with the flowers or something that can feel as though it's bringing you to a state of equanimity and peace, even temporarily. Then begin to let yourself know and feel. And then there's this, and then there's this. And begin to move into a more expansive state. Remembering these little delightful times or scenarios that you can identify with without too much challenge or too much problem, accepting them and embracing them. They're kind of a doorway into a place where you can actually sit with the things or the challenging feelings that feel like losses or, or hardships and just let yourself leave space around them. It's literally like you're not becoming tight or too stuck on any one position that feels painful inherently, you're letting yourself loosen it up and, and finding space within the experience. The easiest way is to just allow yourself to breathe into the stuck places within you that you'll actually feel, maybe feel heavy hearted or like you have a twisted knot in your gut. Just let yourself begin to notice very deliberately and peacefully and, and presently that you can add space. And then begin to let yourself identify more with the space than the opinion or the feeling or the judgment. Just know that space is the healing balm that the more you can identify with the space between the thoughts or the challenging situation, your idea about the challenging situation, just breathe deeply and identify with the space. Then just ask for a shift in perception. That's all it takes. It doesn't take for the whole situation to change immediately. Just the shift in perception, the, the the access to heaven or the access to peace comes from within us because it's a shift in perception. Whenever you can allow for a shift to happen, you're allowing for the broader, more vast perspective to dawn. You'll find that there's peace inherent in that. Go easy on yourself. Be kind to yourself. That's the main thing. And then you'll start to see that things change around you as you begin to resonate more with peaceful, more loving thoughts and experiences for yourself. Okay. Well, that's, that's it. 
there's one more question here that I find really interesting, but it's um, maybe for another time, but I'll just quickly do this one <laughs> as quickly as I can. What are we all so afraid of? We're afraid of our perceptions. We're afraid of the idea that we've been dropped and we have to go, go it alone. We're afraid that this is all there is, that what we can perceive with our five senses is, is it. And that this whole idea of coming to life and being a human being is, is a bad, mean joke. Because of that, we are afraid of whatever we believe is the, the entity in charge of this. Some people call that God. Some people call that, you know, random nature. We're afraid of what we don't embrace. So the whole way home and out of fear is to shatter this perception that we have with embrace. So much embrace that we love it all so much. We don't even have to know why we love it. But in the loving of it, we add the essence of truth to it so that all of the parts of it that are untenable and impossible to embrace begin to be transcended in our embrace. But we have to do that individually. We can't wait for someone else to come along and fix and change it. We have to allow for our own perceptions to shift. And in that, we own a different identity. We own our immortal self. We own the self that can't be touched or harmed in any way that doesn't identify with just being a physical body or a finite mind and intellect. It's the vastness of us that no matter what will be here. And so literally we're afraid of our finite minds and our capacity to trick ourselves into believing that this is all there is and to be afraid of whatever we don't see, the unseen that is beyond it, enough to never touch it enough to know it and its vastness and perfection. So we all need to just come home and be more loving to ourselves, be more kind to ourselves. And what are we also afraid of? Sometimes we're afraid of spending this quality time loving ourselves so impeccably that we shatter the illusions that we have and we realize that only love is real. It's time for us to give up everything else but a very one-pointed intention and perception that only love is real. So if it appears to be unloving, we look, do a deep dive, do a deep dive. Where's the love here? Where's the love? And we'll find it. We'll find what's missing. And then we won't be so scared.